So far we've looked at the passage grammatically and literarily, and now we turn to yet another hermeneutical principle, and that is the historical perspective or the historical principle. And this historical principle is where we have a very clear and direct overlap between uh, our hermeneutic and the four-page method because one of the first pages in the four-page method is the trouble in the text. And so it's very important when you look at any passage you say, you know, what is the trouble in the passage? In other words, the biblical writer isn't just for no reason talking about this subject. You have to say what's going on in a particular church or situation or setting. The impressive German phrase, Sitzum Leben, used to be used, right? What is the Sitzum Leben, the situation in life of a given passage? Or what is the social setting of a particular text? Or what is its historical context? These are all different expressions which get at this historical principle which we're about to use and illustrate right now. Now, at first blush, when we ask the question, what is the trouble in the text, what's going on in our passage, the, the, the general answer is easy, and that is that the Christians in Thessalonica were grieving. More specifically, they were grieving over the death of loved ones. And we already observed how from the grammar, the present subjunctive in verse 13, you, uh, this image of this woman who's who's mourning the loss of her husband soldier. You know, it's not just a little boo-hoo. No, there's a, there's a deep, intense grieving. And uh, if we moved already now, we're not, but if we move from the then and there of the text, exegesis, to the here and now of today, if we went from the trouble in the text to the trouble in the world, it would be pretty easy because all of us, right, have also endured uh, loved ones who have, quote, fallen asleep. All of us know someone who has died and thereby understand some of the grief that goes associated with such a loss. But if we go a little bit deeper, if we act more precisely what is the trouble in the text, then, well, it gets a little more tricky. And in fact, from the reading of mine, from the commentary, you can see that there are at least six different answers given to what is specifically going on. Six different answers as to what is the real or precise trouble in the text. I highlighted one in my interpretation. I'd like to highlight that now. Namely, what was the problem and then what were the grounds to support it? I suggested that the Thessalonian Christians were worried that their fellow believers who had fallen asleep, brothers and sisters who had died, would somehow be at a disadvantage at Jesus' return compared to them who were still alive. Either some of those who had died would either miss out altogether or they wouldn't be able to participate in quite the level of glory that would be associated with that particular event. And although that may sound a bit puzzling for us, you need to recognize that Paul is writing to a persecuted group of Christians. People whose fellow citizens, their neighbors, mocked them and ridiculed them for turning from idols to serve the living and true God, as Paul talks about in chapter 1, verse 9. And so these Christians, these persecuted Christians in Thessalonica, had a burning desire to have their faith well vindicated, right? To be proven that they weren't so foolish after all, that they didn't believe in vain. And so there was an intense longing and anticipation for the great and glorious day of Jesus' return. Not only the benefits, the blessings that would be part of that day and that they would enjoy, but also the sense that they would have their faith vindicated. They would be proved right. And so when some Christians died before that happened, that apparently caused some doubt, some uncertainty, and some grief for the remaining Christians, the living Christians, right, who were still alive. And evidence of that can be found, I think, in four ways in the text. First evidence is the emphatic future negation we noted under our grammatical analysis. We noted that in verse uh, 15, Paul doesn't just say, we who are living who are left till the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. He says, we who are living who are alive, to, alive till the coming of the Lord will who may, will certainly not, will absolutely not, will by no way, Jose, precede those who have, uh, who have already died. And you have to ask yourself, why is Paul being so emphatic here? Is he stressing that we who are living will absolutely not precede those who have died because there are many people who believe that those who have died will be after us? Is it trying to correct some wrong idea? 
Here's a quote from Abraham Mallerby that suggests that that is indeed what happened. He says that, or this, Paul's denial in 4.15 is so strong, right in that emphatic future uh, negation, that it sounds like a denial of an opinion actually held by some people in Thessalonica. In other words, some people did deny that we who are living, right, would not be at an advantage. They thought just the opposite. We would be at an advantage, and thereby they worried over dead Christians who would then be at a disadvantage when Jesus comes again, either missing out altogether or experiencing it in some kind of inferior or secondary way. But there are more clues which strengthen this idea. A second piece of evidence is the sequencing of eschatological events. Paul says at the very end of verse 16 that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then the believers will. Now, whenever a speaker says, first this and then that, well, the speaker is not just telling you what things will happen. They're stressing that they happen in a particular order, in a particular sequence. And especially in the Greek, it's quite unusual to have the adverb first at the very end of the sentence. It almost stresses the first, then aspect of these verses. And this too strengthens the case that there was some confusion about how this was all going to work out. Jesus is coming back, but wait a minute, when do we who are alive enter the picture? And what about those who have died? When do they enter the picture? Do they enter it late in some way that they're at a disadvantage? The third piece of evidence about this trouble in the text, or this view of the trouble in the text, is the addition of a little word in Greek. It's only three letters, hama. And again, please don't make the mistake of thinking little word, right, can't be that important. No, hama. Paul doesn't just say, we with them. Paul adds the word hama with them. We together with them. And the them, of course, are those who have already died, who have fallen asleep. And so Paul is really stressing it's not just we who are living, but we together, at the same time, fully, equally, together with those who have already passed away. And then the final point has to do with word order. In English, I'll use the cursor maybe to highlight that, you can see the prepositional phrase with them, with them. And in English, prepositional phrases typically come at the end of the sentence after the main verb, and we add together, which we've already noted is a stress, right, on the two groups of people. So in English, you can see the way to read this sentence or translate it is, we who are alive will be caught up together with them. But the word order in Greek is different. The word order in Greek is, um, go back one, the word order in Greek is, we who are alive, and then notice how Paul fronts this extra phrase, together with them. He puts it in front of the verb for emphasis. So not only the alive, but we fully, equally together with them will be caught up. In other words, all believers, living and deceased, will share equally in this great and glorious day. And so uh, the trouble in the text is not just a kind of general grieving in the context of death, which is indeed a common problem today, but it was much more precise than that, and that's an important way for understanding what's going on in the text. Well, this is a first and most important example of how we might employ the hermeneutical principle in our study of the text. Here's another example. It has to do with a claim that Paul makes in the opening verse. Verse 13, he says, Not to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Now, some commentators come along and say, Paul, you're exaggerating. You're guilty of hyperbole. It's not the case that the rest of men have no hope in the context of death. In other words, there were some people back then who did believe that there was life after death. And so a good historical question to ask is, well, is Paul right? Or to say it differently, what did people in that day believe if I gave you a tape recorder and say your assignment is to go back in time to the city of Thessaloniki and just ask people, stick a microphone in their mouth and say, you know, what happens to you after you die? What happens to people after they die? What would you find out? And would that support Paul's claim that people, the rest of the world, grieve without hope? Or would you find people who did have hope for themselves or for their loved ones after death? Now, when we do that, we find that, well, Paul actually turns out to be correct. For example, Theocritus, the writer of this ancient kind of nature poetry during the 3rd century, 3rd century BC, says, Hopes are for the living, 
without hope are the dead. This is a great quote because it uses the word hope and connects it with living versus dead. And Theocritus says, you know, anybody who is dead, well, they're without hope. That sounds exactly what, like what Paul says, right? Not to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope in the context of death. Another great example is a popular grave inscription found not only in Greek but also in Latin and scattered throughout the ancient world. The full inscription goes like this, I was not and I was, I am not and I care not. Now, How does that sound to you? Is that a kind of a positive upbeat inscription you might want to put on your gravestone or that of your loved one? And apparently it was widespread, so widespread and known that you could just have, we found a number of gravestones that simply have N, F, F, N, S, N, C. And the reader is expected to know that in Latin it means non fui, fui, non sum, non curo, right? I was not, and I was, I am not, and I don't care. I, I don't give a rip in colloquial terms. Yet another example of the hopelessness in the context of death can be found in this letter. P Oxy 115. So P stands for papyrus. Oxy stands for the place where it was found. Oxy Rhynchus, and it's just number 115. They're into the thousands. So this is one of the early documents that were, so to say, discovered and translated and recorded. Anyway, in this letter, uh, a woman, so she's the author, is writing to a couple, a husband and wife, whose child has recently died. And so she's writing this letter trying to console or comfort this grieving uh, two parents. And uh, she says uh, in the body of the letter, you know, we've done all the customary duties, right? All the kind of things that people did back then just to show that we feel your pain, right? At the very end, she closes the letter this way. And think about the logic that she uses and also the concluding phrase or formula. She says, but nevertheless, one is able to do nothing against such things, namely death, Therefore, comfort yourselves. So what is she saying? She's saying, okay, your child died, but you know, you, you couldn't do anything about it, right? You're not to blame. You were helpless in this situation. There isn't a thing you could have done to stop it. And so comfort yourself in your, I guess, helplessness. But I hope you see how shallow that that kind of comfort would be, right, to a couple who's just lost a loved one. I hope you see how different it is when Paul ends his letter the same way, but with a totally different meaning. Paul also ends our passage by saying, therefore, comfort yourselves. But he says it differently. Therefore, comfort yourself with these words, namely, appealing to first the weighty word of the church, the resurrection of Jesus, which is a guarantee of your deceased loved one's resurrection. So they'll be there when Jesus comes again. And also comfort yourself with the second reason, right? The weighty word of the Lord that promises that we who are living, who are alive till the coming of the Lord will absolutely not, will by no way be ahead of those who have already died. So this letter is, I think, a nice contrast, right? A negative contrast to the positive sense of hope that Paul talks about and the no hope that existed in that day. Seneca was a very famous Roman statesman and philosopher and he referred to the mystery religions because it is true that some of the mystery religions had an idea of life after death. But a couple of important caveats here. One, it wasn't widespread. The common person didn't hold these ideas. And two, these ideas were not very specific or concrete. It was a kind of a nebulous, uh, generic kind of positive thing that might happen to you after you die or life after death. And most people responded the way that Seneca did, right? Seneca says those kind of people who say those things and believe those kind of things, he refers to those as human pipe dreams, right? It's kind of like what those guys been smoking, right? They're just dreaming up some crazy ideas. And so when you do a kind of historical survey of attitudes towards death in the ancient world, you understand why Paul says what he says when he says, don't grieve like the rest of men who have no hope, because the rest of the men typically don't have hope. And even if you didn't have that kind of idea, Paul has a theological reason. Because when Paul views non-Christians, he says in a different letter to a different church, but we get a window into his mind, he says that, that they are, quote, without God in the world, and therefore having no hope. 
So not only historically, but even theologically, Paul would say to believers that non-Christians are a group of people who have no hope. And then that sharpens the contrast when we see these things. It sharpens the contrast to Paul's words to the Thessalonians. And you can see how... Um, how uh, countercultural, how powerful Paul's opening assertion is when he says, we, you know, we don't grieve like the rest of people. The rest of people respond to death with a sense of hopelessness, but we Christians grieve with hope. Well, a third example of historical analysis, right? A different uh, example where we put on our historical hat and we try to understand what's going on is in the phrase, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. And we've already observed that Paul has some word from the Lord Jesus Christ. And this raises then three questions naturally in our minds. Question one would be, where did Paul get this word of the Lord? I mean, not many of us have a word of the Lord. When did Paul get it? Did he get it? Well, I won't give you all the options. I'll just give you the questions for now. Secondly, what in the following verses constitutes the word of the Lord? Right? Paul is about to quote the word of the Lord. Well, I want to find it in these following verses. And the third question is, what is the significance of Paul citing the word of the Lord? The first two questions are interesting, intriguing, but ultimately uh, pastorally not so significant as the third. And so we quickly go through them. Where did Paul get this word of the Lord? And lots of possibilities. It could be an agraphon, right? Graphon, that which is written, ah, not, right? That's the alpha privative. An atheist is somebody who doesn't believe in God. Uh, somebody who lives an amoral life, right? Doesn't have any morals. So an agraphon is something that has not been written down. And it is true that, as John says, you know, the books of this world could not contain all the things that Jesus did and said. And so one possibility is, is that Paul has, has knowledge of one of these sayings of Jesus that never got written down in the four Gospels or in any other source that's available to us. Totally different idea could be that Paul sees himself as a prophet, right? He stands in the line of the prophets, and just like the Old Testament prophets could speak a word of the Lord, for them it would have been a word of God, Paul as a New Testament prophet could feel empowered or uh, able to speak a word of the Lord that is a word of Jesus. Yet another possibility is that Paul is summarizing, in his own words, the teaching of Jesus. So, there are some sayings about the end times found in the Gospels, and Jesus is, uh, sorry, Paul is kind of pulling together, in his own words, the ideas or the teachings of Jesus. Um, that, I think, is the best possibility, and you can see here a scholar who thinks exactly that. Seon Kim says, the several and clear echoes of Jesus' sayings in the passage seem to suggest, notice at least he covers himself, this is the difference between shouting and whispering. There is no room for shouting in this discussion because the evidence isn't that clear. So we're whispering, right? The evidence doesn't allow us to be so definitive. But he says, it seems to suggest that Paul must be conscious of the material he is using as Jesus' material. And therefore, that with the word of the Lord here, Paul is referring to the words of the historical Jesus. So that's one of the questions. Where did Paul get these words? And the answer is, at least the strongest proposed answer, or the answer we whisper, is that Paul is paraphrasing the words or the sayings of Jesus as we meet them with regard to the end times in the Gospels. A different intriguing question is, um, what in the surrounding or following verses constitutes the word of the Lord, right? Because I, I think that Jesus' words are more important than all the other words. I want to make sure they put them in red letters. And so another crass way of putting it is, what in these verses should be in red letters? What actually is the word of the Lord? Now, you know I'm being a bit facetious, and there are big problems with distinguishing the words of Jesus in red letters from the other words as if they somehow are not important. We're not going to get into that now. But the general answer, and again we're whispering, is that Paul first seems to summarize the word of Jesus in his own words. 
So Paul kind of gives the bottom line, or he gives the upchuck of it all, so to say, in verse 15b. Right? He summarizes the relevancy of Jesus' words, and again, they are comforting words, namely that we will ume, we will absolutely not, living Christians, be ahead of dead Christians. Or to say it reversely, dead believers will in no way be at a disadvantage over living Christians at Jesus' return. And then in verses 16 and the first part of 17, we actually get then the word of the Lord, which as we've suggested, Paul is in his own words quoting or summarizing the teachings of Jesus about the end times as we meet them in the Gospels. And then he adds a pastoral conclusion in verse 17b. But the most important question really is the third, and that is, why does Paul cite the word of the Lord? What does he gain, or, or why, why is he doing that? And I hope it's clear to you, and that it, the answer is, is that it adds weight. Paul doesn't say, you know, I just feel. Paul doesn't say, it just seems to me. He's not guessing here, right? It's not some intuition he has. No, he has some words of Jesus, words of Jesus that are trustworthy, words of Jesus that are reliable. Charles Wanamaker says this, by placing his assurance that the living would not have precedence over the dead at the coming of the Lord under the rubric, a word of the Lord, Paul attributed the highest possible authority to his assertion in verse 15b. And that's why I entitled in that exegetical outline, remember the point under 15 was a weighty word of the Lord. It wasn't just a word of Paul. It wasn't just a word of even the Lord. It well, because it was the word of the Lord, it therefore had weight, it therefore had authority, it therefore had trustworthiness and reliability. Well, friends, um, that reaches the end of our historical analysis of the text. And again, we'll take a short break, and we'll, when we come back, we'll approach the text theologically. We'll compare what Paul is saying in this passage with what he and what the rest of the biblical authors say in the rest of Scripture.